ready? Blavatsky, Jung, de Perucker, Theosophical Metapsychology. In 45 minutes. I think I'm going to go through this slide, uh, through the, uh, what do we call these, this PowerPoint a little bit. And uh, instead of reading, go through these uh, a little bit one at a time and, and give some overview and some ideas. And then as we go, also instead of waiting for the end, uh, questions, you know, a little more interactive. The other papers were important to be read as historical and other things, but this is more uh, to do with uh, our inner process. So maybe we'll, I'll go a little more, uh, little by little here. So in Blavatsky's uh, Three Fundamental Propositions of the Secret Doctrine, uh, in short, and Herman has loaned me his, some of his uh, PowerPoint slides from another presentation. The boundless, oops, well, the boundless leapt. <laughs> In, <clears throat> omnipresent, eternal, boundless, immutable principle. I think principle is an important word. The boundless, omnipresent, eternal, boundless, immutable principle. So later we will look in a moment on Carl Jung's idea of the, quote, unconscious. Jung drawing on from German philosophers in one respect, Schopenhauer used the word unconscious. Second, cyclic motion, absolute universality of the law of periodicity, flux and reflux, ebb and flow. Three, fundamental identity of all souls with the universal oversoul. Obligatory pilgrimage for every soul, a spark of the former through the cycle of incarnation. So within this, there's an immutable principle, and then there's an idea of continuous emanation and evolution. In Buddhism, this boundless could be called the alaya, this or alaya vijnana. This term is used by Duparukar in his, uh, again, in the booklet just republished here, that Herman has there. So the alaya is like the sometimes translated as storehouse consciousness. Now this is not an exact equation of, of this boundless immutable principle, but very close. This is what's found in Yogacara Buddhism. So let's go to the next slide and, and we'll maybe go back and forth. So Theosophia, originally that's found in Greece and Egypt, psychological point of view. Go ahead. So here we have body, soul, and spirit. In Greek, we have nous, psyche, and soma. Or more specifically, the Greek is broken down there. Egyptian. Again, it's interesting, atmu, atma, Egyptian and, and Indian, almost the same sound. Theosophy, atma, buddhi, manas, kama, prana, linga, sharira. Do we have the slide where I have Jung's further along somewhere? <laughs> we don't have this in very good order, but. So basically in theosophy is looking at a big overview. It's going from universals to particulars. This is an essential uh, core viewpoint difference between theosophical tradition and that of Jung. Jung is rather uh, sometimes adamantly and sometimes uh, almost desperately attempting to convince everyone he's being a scientist and is going from particular evidence to universals uh, even later in his life. So here's Jung's archetypal psychology. But again, Jung here, uh, for example, You know, it's, and it's really true in the development of his life, which I'll go back to in a moment. He's really searching within himself, especially from the period, say, about 1900 to 
the First World War, 1914. He's in a tremendous struggle to understand the nature of himself and of the expression of the, what he would later term the unconscious, in his patients. Here are people are having these, uh, especially psychotic and schizophrenic patients, are having these tremendous visions and, and dreams and things, and it, he's trying to understand what is the psyche, the human being, attempting to do here? What is happening? And as he slowly puts this together, which we may want to just, from the top down, place an overlay on things, say this is our universals and we have these ideas. Jung is building up from his experience and he's finding in that exploration, yes, the psyche in the world is alive. Not only that, it contains uh, not just the personal suppressed elements that Freud would postulate, which Jung has in his concept of shadow, the personal suppressions of our of our ego consciousness, ego and not the theosophical ego, but ego meaning our self-awareness in Jung's terms, not the theosophical reincarnating ego is a different, completely different idea. Uh, and Jung finds these experiences in himself and in his uh, clients uh, to be indicative of that there's something much more going on. The Freudian view is limited. And he begins to see, he has these tremendous dreams that there are these, is a transcendent or transpersonal aspect, a living transpersonal aspect to human beings. So at the core of that, you know, from in the roots of the collective unconscious is that there's an, what he calls an organizing principle to the unconscious, which he calls the self. You know, back in our theosophical model, we have uh, the Atma Buddha, Buddhi Manas, the higher aspect of Manas, we generally refer to as the higher self. But we really must sometimes ask the question, what is this higher self in our day-to-day -day life and practice? <clears throat> so as Jung develops this uh, scheme, he finds that there are encounters of the self take place. He finds it in his clients and associates who are very much involved with what uh, integrating the deeper aspects of themselves as human beings and they encounter what they, he has, they have encounters with what he calls uh, the numinous. Rudolf Otto, Otto con coins the word numinous, numinosa meaning the presence of something very sacred. We can go back to this, maybe let's go to another Yes, yeah, so we have Freud, Adler, Jung, Asagioli, uh, important peoples in psychoanalysis. Is anyone here familiar with Roberto Asagioli? Much? Uh, I don't know a lot about his life. He wrote a very wonderful book, What We May Be. Um, he incorporates many of more of the spiritual dimensions that we'd find sourced in theosophy in his theories and practice. I'll read a quote from him a little later. Go ahead. So the psyche is the intermediate part of our nature. You know, we could, could relate it to the, the uh, uh, in a sense, to the manas or the kama manas in theosophy. Go ahead. You know, we have our transitory uh, existence in expressing itself in our um, physical form, the middle part of ourselves, the learning part in our soul, and the immortal part in our spiritual center. Again, Jung, in developing his scheme, he makes no, uh, what he would call metaphysical leaps. So while at the end of his life, he is definitely implying, you know, the... Uh, the deep source of self, and he's, he won't, you know, when someone asks him, I think, about reincarnation, he hedges, he won't answer. He uh, stops, but at one point, the most transforming thing that happened to Jung was when he had a, a major heart attack in his mid-60s, and in, that's re recounted in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, and in that experience, uh, he has a, a visionary, a sort of out-of-body experience that was really quite extraordinary. He's uh, 
leaving the earth below him and he's entering into space and there's a temple in space and he enters into the temple and there's a, someone sitting at the end of the temple in meditation with his face down and he thinks this is really strange and as he gets closer he sees the face and the face was his own face and the, it remained meditating. And he knew at that moment that if this seeming, this, this uh, symbolic dream, image, vision, that if the being had awoken, that he would have died. And that that was an image of his, what you call a higher self. As if he is the mortal being dreamed by a higher being. So this is very much in line with the theosophical view, if that makes sense. It was quite an unusual experience. It really changed him tremendously after that. Unconscious. Conscious, collective, individual, unconscious, collective, individual. <clears throat> yeah, and I think the original German, maybe someone can check, Am I, I do not speak German, is actually, correct translation to English would be unconscious, ed that which we are not aware of, not unconscious as an object. So we have our day-to-day -day life of what we are aware of, personally, individually, and then collectively, and then underneath all that, what is happening? The hidden drives and motivations and unconscious uh, energies inside and outside that move us along. Go ahead. Oh, we're back again. Good. So for Jung, the ego is simply I, this self-awareness. Shadow is his term for the elements that we suppress from view, personally. Four psychological types functioning within that Ego awareness were paired as opposites, so intuition and sensation are one pair, and thinking and feeling another pair. And then he, with that he also has introversion and extroversion as basic psychological traits. Yeah. Can you say that uh, it's suppressing or does that we don't know that they are there? Both. Yes, absolutely okay. right. And also Jung makes it clear and different from Freud's view perhaps that th this is not just the garbage bin. Actually within elements that are unlived uh, can be extremely positive qualities that have been left out based on uh, some kind of uh, perhaps fear or avoidance or something like that. So the shadow is a very complex thing, not simply a negative thing. Yeah, absolutely. And then within that he, he postulates that each person, uh, that uh, men predominantly have a feminine counterpart uh, as the anima. And this shows up in dreams and myths and things. And women, a, a masculine counterpart in the less conscious than our normal everyday consciousness. And centering the, you know, within the center of the psyche in the world is a idea of self, this uh, transcendent organizing principle to the unconscious. So all of this is very... Um, revolutionary in the psychological world and still is today really even though it's gained much more wide uh, interest you still rarely find Jung uh, taught in a university for example and within this he talks about the individuation process now this is very close so not quite the same but again we look at some parallels to the theosophical idea of uh, Swabhava, uh, our innate characteristic or unique uh, um, 
deep unique uh, uniqueness, unique uh, uh, feature. So individuation for Jung is when the ego is, and the person is integrating and growing in the alignment of the ego self access is, has some connectivity starting. And this growing of consciousness takes place. In theosophy, we find this in, uh, defined quite differently, but still quite parallel, uh, where, especially again in the, I keep talking about the book just published, but in the, the first book of Peruker on esoteric teachings outlines the idea of what the theosophy would call chalaship or discipleship, and then how, uh, Entering into that process of understanding opens us to connecting to this sense of self and the uh, path that that entails. Differences there are perhaps in theosophy, there is a clearer outline of the motivational aspect and of the, some of the uh, ethical principles involved. Jung leaves that more to individual exploration. So the idea of emanation is the idea in theosophy that we are the emanation of a higher being in a sense, or a higher core consciousness. These things emanate out to the different levels that were described earlier. Evolution is to bring outward what is within. Emanation is flowing outward, a space for other beings to be used for a combined manifestation higher and lower. If we had lines, you know, emanation would be the vertical line, and then evolution would be the horizontal line. Evolution would be taking place in past, present, future, in a sense, historicity, and emanation would be uh, more transcendently present in a vertical dimension. Akasha, the cosmic spirit substance, the reservoir of beings and of beings. So we have different uh, words for this. The Adi Buddha in, Northern, in Mahayana Buddhism, Swabhava, Ether, fifth cosmic element. All these are terms. You could even say shunyata, emptiness in one way. So this is like this uh, vast, uh, all-encompassing something, nothing that contains everything. Very difficult to talk about. At least I find it difficult. If we label it, we'll, we won't do well with it. There's a vast space within which everything is. And yet everything that is, is also that space as well. Perhaps that's one way. Next. Mm, so you could look at it metaphysically. So there's this great space and then there are these levels. And then everything that is happening, everything we are doing is reflected back and forth in this space. So we, uh, this is where the notion of karma comes into place. Everything affects everything. Nothing disappears. Next. Yeah, so you could talk about the astral. So it's like the receptive, uh, well, what's the scientist? Uh, um, morphic resonant fields. Um, yeah, Sheldrake uses that term in science now, morphic resonant fields. These are all just labels or words. Blavatsky used the term astral light. We use that in theosophy quite usually. 
but that there's these again on you know when I well they showed it with uh, what's his name Moriyama more more did the water yeah so you know the when I when I drink this water I'm now in the water all right I can be measured well and Richard has shown you know the in homeopathy now they can measure the the uh, surface tensegrity of the water and when the remedy is put in, is that correct? They're doing research on that. Yeah, close. France, they just gave a talk on that uh, earlier this year. He was a Nobel Prize winner saying that the agitation, et cetera, of the remedy with water sends an electromagnetic wave to the water, which picks it up. That's the latest. Right, so in theosophy, we describe that in terms of the this subtle field of uh, called the astral light is this receptive uh, uh, stuff that uh, coll you know collects the memory of everything is set there. But closer and closer we get to actually being able to uh, scientifically experience this. But in our own lives, psychologically, uh, you know, it's also everything that's in our more and more found today, for example, that it, memory is not, we're like, where is memory, for example? Well, more and more memory is not here in the brain at all. Memory is in the entire body, in every organ. This is experienced more and more in various psychological methods and things today as well, where uh, it's also used in treating trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, using various methods to release the traumatic memory from the body system. These are ways in which the memory and our psychology interacts with these, the uh, astral memory field, you could call it, and we have to come to terms with these things in a higher way, more conscious way, through our, uh, theosophy would say, our, our higher monastic uh, faculties. And then in doing that, what happens? Is everything is transformed automatically. It's in a transformation in that awareness. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm making sense. I'm just talking here. You know, and this is where in Buddhist uh, practice, various forms of uh, popularized today in America, we have, you know, thousands of people being mindful. Well, what are they being mindful of? What is this doing? All this is quite, you know, and theosophists can be mindful too, I think. So we're a very mindful group. Point Loma, the Raja Yoga system was extraordinarily set up to, as a mindfulness method from all day long. From it begins in silence, you know, and the, the children wake up, meet in silence, you're eating in silence. It's like a Buddhist monastery, and even for all ages. Next. Yeah, thinking and motive, thinking, feeling, all these different aspects of us create who we are. Next. Hmm. So one of the uh, yoga systems has these four levels of awareness. Very simple. Of course, this is from a few thousand, a couple thousand years ago, but fits in today with science very well. So there's our waking consciousness sleeping and dreaming. And within sleeping and dreaming, there's dreamless sleep. Does anyone remember last night? No, of course not. It's without, uh, it's dreamless. And then we have our spiritual divine consciousness, highest level of samadhi or awakening. This actually can be overlaid to the, uh, I didn't put it together in a chart, but it could be put together with the theosophical constitution of a human being quite well. I'm not gonna say how, though. I'm sending everyone to look at it and think for a minute. So where would manas, kama manas, buddhi manas would fall? Where, in one sense? Of course, it all is in our waking state, but in these other states of consciousness, the 
you know, we are moving through our inner constitution as we sleep and wake. You know, sleeping, as uh, de Bruker often says, is a form of dying. Literally, our constitution comes apart, and then we wake up the next morning reincarnated quite nicely. Or not, maybe not always quite nicely, I don't know. But Anyway, next. Hopefully. Hmm, we kind of went through this already. Let's go. I don't know what we're... Uh. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, this is good. Yeah, so we're always receiving and transmitting. Why don't you say something, Herman? Yeah. Oh, exactly what you were saying. It was uh, to demonstrate that without that we realize that we're always receiving and transmitting to that particular part of the universe and building up uh, images and uh, ideas and receiving uh, ideas and so on, making ourselves by being, sending and, and, and transmitting. Yep. Yeah, so what I wanted to try and add here, I don't have an image for, but in theosophy there's an idea of what's called the antaskarana, which is the thread or link between our principles. So in that other diagram, we have it's as if there's a thread between everything. It's just, for example, it's very simple. I mean, how is it that we do fall asleep at night and that we do wake up the next morning and we're still, quote, unquote, the same person? Hmm, it seems rather uh, like one could either say this is a really stupid comment or one could say this is very profound. So it's really quite something that it takes place. And then we see, and this is very important, and you also have the Indian theosophy of the Sutratma. So this is the thread self that continues from life to life. What is it that continues? What is this thread? So, and then you have attempting to discover and the uh, in different psychological problems, you know, problems of psychosis and schizophrenia and borderline personality disorders and um, all kinds of, or you know, less, less, you know, whatever kinds of problems there are. A lot of these, I think, are related to disruptions in this antas karana. This is a very kind of esoteric, deep subject, and to have simple answers for it, each case is different. And then, so within this model too, there's receiving and transmitting. Uh, and then also within that process, the, I would add, there's containing. Is there another, what do we have next? It's a guess here. Again, yeah, so here this uh, collective higher, individual higher, individual lower, collective lower. Mm, this, using general terms, relates both to theosophical and Jungian thought. Again, in Jung's experience, what would often happen is uh, what he would say, uh, the psyche would receive an overload from either even the collective higher or even the collective lower. But if the container wasn't ready, it would break. And in that breaking, that's what uh, would then, if, you know, either for a short time or longer time, could uh, the kinds of symptoms labeled as psychosis or schizophrenia could appear in that way. Yeah. In this scheme, could you, I, I think the human will is in order to put there also? The what? The human will, the will. Oh, the will. Yes. Certainly, yes. And actually in Asagioli's uh, psychotherapy uh, and in, in theosophy as in Perukar, the spiritual will, will is very important because it's through engaging in the the, I mean, it's a really, it's a, it's a don't we, I wish there was a better word in English, perhaps. 
but that that force or that energy that brings us to be able to f um, focus on the path that leads us to our higher self, perhaps you could say. So what is that? Intent. Huh? Intention. Yeah, intention. Yeah, the, uh, is that on? The uh, Buddhist Buddha himself defined uh, uh, will, intention, purpose as karma. It's uh, right. the word is satana or satana. So therefore, wherever we, and this doesn't have to be a conscious intention, where we decide that's helpful, but our life purpose, such as it is, is from past intent, and so that's why this uh, notion of having a purposeful life of a higher nature is so important. Now you can do the lower nature too, and have the uh, get that result, but intention, purpose, will, uh, what is what's another word? Very important. That, that can override and be either salvation or the curse. So again, here in theosophical view is this uh, boundless or over soul, spirit, soul, body, immortal part, learning part, transitory part. Next. Are there any more? Hmm. Yeah, okay. The last two. Yeah. You were jumping this one. Yeah. But you talked about Anna. Mm, yeah. And I think those uh, circles try to explain that. Oh, okay. Let's stop there again. So. The idea from this uh, slide was to show that the learning part can be directed to the immortal part because the yellow uh, circle is shift up or mm. it can be uh, connected more to the body part and then oh, it is drop down. So that's more or less to show to you that there is an option in which direction you like to think, receive, yes? Yeah, so uh, y this is really good because, I mean, you could actually put all these circles on top of each other or very far apart from each other. Uh, and actually throughout our day, they're doing this all the time. So, the, you know, as we become more clear and motivated and uh, mindful and aware, the more and more alignment can take place. But this, you know, and you can make a much more elaborate and dynamic uh, diagram, but... Basically, these, these, uh, our principles are, and our uh, our awareness is not some like. Uh, it's more like the uh, modern physics atom. We're we're not like some solid fixed uh, billiard balls, but it's this very dynamic movements of energies that become more and more uh, focused depending on our intention and our awareness. And this interconnectivity is what we call in theosophy the antaskarana. Yeah. And again, you know, the antaskarana, uh, I'm trying to speak maybe practically a little bit, but again, the container aspect is really crucial at times in this middle part. And when that gets disrupted and broken, then various things that we view as pathologies take place. Yeah. Could you say something about curing mental disease from the perspective of disruptions in Andaskarana? <laughs> but I'm trying to, is, you know, I'm using different language, you know, so it's like I'm, I, I, I let me go on and I'll come back to that. Maybe. Maybe can can <laughs> can I give it to try? 
Sure. Yeah, then maybe I can add in, something. In very general terms, from a theosophical point of view, is that you have to control yourself so that if you are willing to connect more with the body, okay, it is your choice. And normally it is not much of a problem. If you are connected more to the body because there is pain coming <coughs> from it, then it can be a problem. And then you have to learn to treat it. And the same is the situation with the immortal part. Is there is a lot of information coming from the immortal part and you are not trained to handle that in a proper way, you can have all type of delusions and you have a problem. If you are understanding what is coming from the immortal part and you know how to place it, yes, then there is no illness at all. So in very general terms, and I'm of course not a professional and Ken is much more working in that field, so that is the general solution for it, but the only next step is it, how do you conduct or help or give instructions to a patient to get them in the right way. Training, mental training, from a theosophical point of view, I think mental is the most important part to be trained. Yeah? So a couple of ideas come to mind uh, in my little, within Herman's comments. Uh, one was an, a simple thing a Zen master in Japan did a number of years ago. His name is Soen, Soen Nakagawa Roshi, very famous, very uh, current Roshi, died about, mm, I don't know, 20 years ago. So at his monastery, he wanted to give some benefit to people with schizoaffective disorders. So what did he do? It's really very interesting. He decided he would have the person come in a small room, very uh, zen, nothing in it, just a bed and some things. And he would have them stay for three days. And in the three, you know, they'd have their meals and everything. And these would probably be people not, uh, not medicated and not severe uh, schizophrenic uh, psychosis or something, but something in the middle. And he had someone, he had monks in the next room 24 hours a day for the three-day period, hitting a drum at the rate of the heartbeat. And the results were very positive. So now you, there are a whole bunch of reasons why this could be beneficial and was. But basically in more recent developments in developmental psychology, it can be looked at that in terms of the earliest times of childhood and the bonding relationships of the child with the mother especially and also with the father, that in these early experiences as the, the disruptions at different ages affect the core physiology of the neurological system and the brain and also affect our whole object, what's called object relations, uh, and that this is the foundation of where different kinds of things labeled different ways in modern psychology as schizoaffective, autistic, uh, all different forms come from different kinds of disruptions on the subtle levels at these early times in childhood. Now, science is looking at this as causal uh, theosophy, we might take a different view, as this is a reflective patterning based on the person reincarnating, perhaps. Nonetheless, solutions come through the same avenue today. I think it can, you know, slowly reaching some, some theosophical kinds of avenues. A good book on the subject that tries to integrate all of this into one huge system. It's a rather uh, daunting book to read. It's called The Point of Existence by a man named A.H. Almas. He's integrating developmental psychology, Buddhism, Sufism, big overview, very spiritual perspective. Rather difficult book to read, I have to say, but worth the reading. Uh, is that helpful? I don't know. Certainly in also various forms of trauma release going on today, also based on releasing traumas from, again, that early, earliest levels of childhood where we're uh, not self-conscious entirely. So releasing these traumas, uh, Peter Levine has a couple of uh, books and therapies that are very useful there.
again looking at the body, again, even in theosophy, body is not really body. It's the expression of the emanation of these. In the vertical dimension, it's the emanation of all these principles coming together. And this physical form is the clothing. So again, modern psychology has become much closer to that. From that point of view, I think um, the Raja Yoga training from KT steps in for me very well because she helps to develop the stability and having control of the impact and the influence coming from outside and also uh, trains very well how to behave in certain conditions. So from that point of view, I think it is not an an example of curing, but it is an example of training to become a very stable person. Yeah. Yes, certainly uh, the. I mean, the elements of Raja Yoga today we might look at as being really uh, a, again, again a kind of daunting, daunting kind of discipline about it, but in actual fact, it's really creating a very again a very strong container for these principles to interact with and for experience to happen. You know, as the as uh, the visiting Japanese uh, professor said in the paper given earlier, uh, it reminded him of his samurai education. I mean, this is not a, a slight statement. He's talking about his education in like the 1890s still, which was the old way. It was really quite something. So, Raja Yoga was similar to the samurai education. Uh, but I can understand that. I mean, it was... Uh, and 24 hour a day, seven day a week, all year round education. It wasn't just, you know, a few little hours a day. We, you know, people go to school now and then, oh, I'm free, I get to go do what. It's like it was total immersion education. And then within that, the different principles of theosophy applied. It's quite an amazing thing, really. Next. Is there any more? What do we have? Oh, back here. Missing elements. What was the use of seven jewels here? I mean, this, I could go into this, but... The idea was that this is the missing elements what uh, the modern shrinks uh, don't have. Oh, I see. And if you want to understand the complete situation of what is the reason that someone is ill, you should take into account the missing parts. Sagioli said, uh, perhaps the best way to state our differences with Jung is with a diagram of the psychic functions. Jung differentiates four functions. I mentioned earlier sensation, feeling, thought, and intuition. So this is more aligned with theosophy, though we would try to be a little more clear, or maybe Sagioli is more clear elsewhere. But he says, cycles, um, our view can be visualized like this. We hold that outside imagination or fantasy is a distinct function. There's also a group of functions that impels us toward action in the outside world. This group includes instincts, tendencies, impulses, desires, and aspirations. And here we come to one of the central foundations of psychosynthesis. There is a fundamental difference between drives, impulses, and desires. Uh, if we were back in our other scheme, this, we would be looking at the threefold nature in the broad sense, that this, these are, we were looking at where this impulse and drive and motivation, where is it coming from? You know, it comes from, and how is it being, you know, focused and utilized? Uh, again, there's a fundamental difference between the drives, impulses, desires, and the will. In the human condition, there are frequent conflicts between desire and will. And we will place the will in a central position at the heart of self-consciousness or the ego. I might disagree with him there. I think will actually comes from higher manas. But uh, generally I, I like uh, psychosynthesis idea. Anything more? What do we have? Oh. Time, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) 
So there's a statement in The Secret Doctrine where Blavatsky, she, again, she talks about time, and she uses the term duration in contradistinction to time. So time is, and then she de defines time as the illusion created by the successive change in states of consciousness. This is very difficult, really, or very simple, but very profound, very important. So this is from a short talk Peruker gave. He's using the Greek mythological view of past, present, and future. The present is, and these are, is spinning the present. These are the three fates. The present, symbolized by the moon, is a psycho-personal part of our nature, an active present mind. So what is this? This is kama manas in theosophy, or ego consciousness in Jung. Our daytime consciousness, normally in our sense of half awake, half asleep, going through our daily patterns with not much awareness that we do habitually, the present. But what is the present? The present is working out what has already happened in the past. So the past in this uh, Greek idea is this grave maidens pointing with a stick to the horoscope. Uh, in the sense, this is what we, the qualities that one's born with, and this is what's being worked out in the present. This is what fate has given you. Of course, fate meaning our past karma has come to fruition and is coming forth and manifested here in this present time. And the future is our motivations and impulses to our, our higher mind, in a sense, ideally. And this is seen as the spiritual, or the sun is symbolized in the future in this Greek diagram. This is our, our goals and motivations and the higher vision that motivates us, carrying us forward. So this is like a more, the past, present, future is like our, the evolution of what's been emanated from a higher source. Yeah, so how, again, this Antaskarana or Sutratman links everything together. So this, that's what is, it's not like, uh, you know, oh, I'm sending a message to this other part of myself and it's coming back. It's already linked, but there is a communication going on. So human ego speaks in other language than the personal ego. So Jung would say that that language is often the language of symbols and mythology and even in becoming highly aware of our dreams or in, in theosophy, in our study of we could call metas, our meta-science, metaphysical science, just the very act of engaging these ideas as Blavatsky describes in her notes to... Uh, Bowen on how to study the secret doctrine. The act of engaging these in these ideas changes our very cellular nature of our brain and our whole system. This is a transformational thing, and because this is this is linking in the language that uh, we're using language in quotes. It's a kind of a language that transforms our our uh, the in integration of our whole system. So again, there's this uh, transmitting and receiving. I would say also with transmitting and receiving, there's again containment again, I'm gonna keep mentioning because in with containment is where we can digest. We have to digest and assimilate. And it's in that digesting and assimilation phase needs to be strong enough to both receive and transmit. Personal ego has to learn and understand something from the language of the human ego. In Sufism, uh, they have a really wonderful way of referring, I think it's to the same concept, in that uh, in distinction to Buddhism, where uh, perhaps we talk about enlightenment, and it's seen as 
we can get carried away with the notion. In Sufism, they speak about becoming the true human being, which we have not yet become, but is archetypally or transcendently there, the true human being. So this true human being is the human ego, that the personal ego, as we go through our, our gradual development, uh, become more and more in line with this, this true human being. Yeah, again, this relates to the other idea of the three levels, of, four levels of consciousness. So we have to interpret what's coming in sometimes. We have to work at it a lot. There's a lot of uh, uh, homework to be done sometimes from the, to really understand the nature of what's coming into us. Because in this receiving mode, sometimes we receive things and we don't understand them immediately. It takes quite some time to work it out. So it's important to... Uh, hold that and work with it. You know, in modern psychology in times, you know, it's popular people do journaling and people draw and people paint and people write poetry. And all these expressions are really at core important because they are ways of integrating these, these uh, higher impulses. Because if, if they're not enacted, the, as Jung would say, they must be enacted or the uh, unconscious can overload one in ways that manifest in very negative ways. So it's important to integrate these things through our creative activities. And again, in the Raja Yoga system at Point Loma, this was incorporated in one's daily activity. You know, everyone, everyone had, it was like had to, everyone played or music every day. Everyone, almost even in the garden, you were in the garden working every day, in addition to regular academic uh, abstract study. There were these engaged kinds of activities also drama, not every day, but period, you know, frequently. End? Yeah. Isn't that the same one? No? <laughs> oh, they're arrows. At least things are getting closer. The, uh, the, yeah, they're starting to overlap, you know, I like that. Yeah. Well, again, we, we're, we're in the middle here. We're, in, we're all in the middle. So as we go in the middle, you know, as, the, you know, as Blavatsky described it, manas, manas is, uh, you know, the neutral or, or basic state of awareness. If it could be just as, as zero, it, it, maybe that would be uh, interesting, but it's not. So it's constantly in this dynamic of, of where it's headed to and where its, its motivation lies. The overlapping of the circles is just meant to make clear that the circle parts need aspects from the other parts to have communication. So the body and the soul, the overlaying parts, make sure that there is something in the soul what is related to the body. And in the body there is a part or a higher part what is related to the soul. So that is the, the interconnection, the interskarana between the different uh, circles. And diseases can be that the, that... that uh, communication part is disturbed. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Eldon, you had a question? Yeah. Oh. Okay, yeah? Many, many years ago, uh, we looked during a lecture to the egg shaped diagram, I don't know how you call it, of a GDP the egg with the line, the, the normal diagram everyone knows. Esoteric tradition. and Esoteric fun, tradition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the highest part uh, is called the archetypal world. Ah. And I was so curious, I asked Mr. Koch, is what GDP uh, mentions the same as Jung's archetypal world? And then he was a real teacher. He asked me, what does Jung mean? Uh, and that's a, a good thing to let people start thinking for themselves. And up to nowadays, I don't know what Jung meant by it. I, by archetypal. Archetypal world, the archetypal world. You also had it in your uh, diagram. And uh, can you explain more about that? For I couldn't find it in Jung. 
Oh, yeah, it pervades Jung. Jung speaks of archetypes as mm, primal forms that infuse the patterning of our, on a deep level, not a conscious level, of the, the patterning of our human psyche come from archetypal forms that are deeply embedded in our human interactions and behaviors and everything. Uh, to simply say, for example, that Jung's archetypes are, has the same meaning as Plato's archetypes, I would say it's very close. But again, as Jung built his system in a very empirical sort of way, and he, he, he really did, at the same time he does seem to be following rather uh, perennialist and theosophic ideas. Uh, and I did find recently in reading I'd been doing that he did have a copy of the Secret Doctrine in his library. Not only that he read G.R.S. Mead and met Mead, uh, who was Blavatsky's uh, secretary for a period, and but that he also had the Secret Doctrine. Was, uh, I didn't know that until uh, a few months ago. The uh, Someone has ever, I think it's in Zurich, if anyone goes to Zurich, it would be nice to get permission to ask to see that and see what notes there are in it, if any. And that shouldn't, at this point in time, I don't think that would be difficult to, to get that permission. Um, but anyway, back to archetypes. So, these deep, uh, again, this is in Blavatsky. She's pointing out the commonality of mythic, uh, representations in different cultures. So, for just the basic idea of, say, the the death and resurrection myth in Christianity being found in Egyptian and other sources, these were not necessarily historical links here. These are deep uh, motifs that are expressions from the human psyche of transformational processes. So. These expressions, Jung would call the expressions of core archetypal foundations in the human, deep in the human psyche. Yeah? So, uh, another uh, word for archetype could be the oversoul, the world oversoul? I think Jung would correlate the word unconscious with oversoul. The archetypes would, in a sense, be within this unconscious field, unconscious field, or the else we call the, uh, you know, the oversoul or boundless or the alaya or many names, yeah? But one of the problems I found with Jung is that um, the words during his lifetime gets always an, an other or a growing definition. So even by doing a reprint, he was not uh, reframing from rewriting parts of it because he was coming to sharper definition, other ideas, and so on. So it is quite uh, dynamic, the use of his uh, types, archetypes. If you read his early works, uh, it has a different definition than later on. So. Yeah, certainly. Keeps you, keeps you awake. <laughs> Jung, Jung from the mid 1930s later, or 19, is, is of course more and more profound. Especially the period that he coming in contact with Richard Wilhelm and, uh, and uh, other people, what has to do more with the uh, Taoistic uh, uh, information, the book he had uh, translated and so, the Golden Tulip. Yep. Right, starting about 1930, Jung, of course, uh, is very young. Uh, Richard Wilhelm returns from China to Germany. Wilhelm is the known today very well as the translator of the I Ching, and he also did books on Lao Tzu, Confucius, Secret of the Golden Flower on Chinese uh, transformational alchemy text. So Jung, reading these things, and I don't know if Jung knew of Wilhelm before, or they corresponded, but perhaps uh, Wilhelm had grown up in China. Uh, his, I think his parents were missionaries, perhaps, so he was fluent in Chinese. 
Uh, Wilhelm also had uh, theosophical connections quite closely uh, with uh, some Point Loma theosophists. I don't know how much Wilhelm studied theosophy. It's possible he did. Certainly there was correspondence and interaction there, sharing of ideas. So this, uh, and then Evans Wentz also publishes the Tibetan Book of the Dead, as it's uh, called in English about that a little before then. Uh, these are the first major texts coming from, some of the first coming from, from uh, Asia into the Western world. So Jung's very excited. He writes introductions to both of these and immediately interprets them in ways that uh, scholars criticize him for today. But as claiming he didn't understand them in their oriental context. But in spite of that, what he's saying is really quite interesting. Uh, and it fuels him to engage in some of the deeper ideas and commonalities between East and Western mythologies and religions much more at that point. Any more questions? And I think I, I feel like asking Richard to comment because part of the therapeutic view that fits in with theosophy with, uh, in forms of the psychology of, of so-called mental illnesses is, is, again, the idea that things are working from within without, which is a core principle of homeopathy. Uh, do you want to say anything? I think it's important because it has to do with the idea of emanation. And uh, yes. Uh First, I think it uh, is important to emphasize, as you were saying, about the receiving and sending. Again, uh, in GDP's esoteric tradition, I pointed this out last year, uh, that really, uh, in a lot of ways, the brain is like a radio receiver or a computer, if you will, bringing in information from primarily in our area, the astral, the astral light, especially if it's more negative, and then sending it out. We're doing that all the time. In other words, the brain is absolutely necessary for mental function, just like a radio is absolutely necessary for getting music or whatever, and computer, etc. but it is not the whole mind. So with that in, that in mind, and um, getting into more of the psychological aspects, I can only tell you from my experience in homeopathy, which is a Western herbal medicine, meaning like pain or like suffering, started in Germany with Dr. Hahnemann 200 years ago. I have seen psychotic patients um, who, uh, in my opinion, are bringing in uh, living, if you will, entities into them. And uh, you could call them elementals, uh, you could call them whatever, but these are entities that are negative, which uh, the astral light is especially um, associated with and uh, is influencing us. And uh, so uh, this may not be the most popular scientific way of looking at it and the most up to date because this is past stuff that you know deals with other entities around us. But I think we're dealing with this. I have two patients uh, who uh, I can think of right now that I gave homeopathic medicines. Uh, one is certainly psychic and could see different type of entities and elementals. He would, you know, say, describe them, air, earth, fire, and water, if you will, uh, and associated pictures associated with these elementals. She's very psychic and she was going, and she was manic depressive. And uh, um, this was what she was doing. She was seeing these things and it was causing her a great deal of harm. The right homeopathic medicines that fit that picture, which I won't say the specific ones, helped her with this to cope with it rather than having to take uh, medication which has side effects and really all it does is cut back the frequency of what she's bringing in on turning the frequency on the radio, so to speak, and not getting more to the source. Another one, uh, again, was seeing things. Uh, a young lady, under 14, 15, 16, uh, who uh, was also doing this. And I think, uh, and again, seeing things, and the parents were very concerned, and you fit the medicine that fits that picture to stimulate the immune system and the vital force to 
to get this in more harmony and disharmony so that she wouldn't be sensitive to these things like most of us are not. So those are some ideas. I don't want to get too scattered or go too long on this, but those are some ideas I have on it. Yeah, there are many new therapies developing around uh, different psychological imbalances and systems that are showing to be more and more beneficial. They have, uh, now I forget the name, the DBT is, uh, Huh? Yes, thank you. I'm so used to using it. And I, and I made a joke out of it in another way, so I was like... Anyway, so, yeah. Dialectical behavioral. behavioral therapy is derived heavily from mindful Buddhist practice. And this is used for so-called borderline personality disorders, and there's centers all over the country, youth world, do, doing this now. And it's uh, proving somewhat effective, I would say, it's a good, uh, you want to comment, Sally? Yeah. yeah. Um. But there's, again, there's more and more confluence between neuroscience and uh, Buddhist meditative methods, especially at the current little wave happening in that direction, mm -hmm. and psychotherapy. So this is a positive and rather theosophical in its impact. I know in, in uh, current therapeutic circles, uh, especially in short-term therapy, uh, I, your word of containment, uh, we're providing boundaries and containment uh, that aren't there normally in the person because there's a bleed-through. Um, and um, in this dialectical behavioral therapy, they are teaching the mindfulness quite heavily. And, um, and by providing that, that containment and, and teaching the patient to hold their own, so to speak, so they can digest it, is proving quite effective. Are we out of time, I think? Yeah. No? Yeah, Eldon. If I could uh, make a comment about uh, uh, archetypal things. Sure. Just, just a slight variation on the idea that uh, when we think of the archetypal, uh, um, the first thing that might come to mind is something mechanical like a cookie cutter stamping out identical molds out of uh, uh, cookie dough or something. But uh, um, I, I would say that the archetypal is an original insider life experience seeing something directly in and of itself. Hmm. And the prototypal is the ways that we uh, give expression to it, the ways, like, like if we have a, like a primal experience of seeing like a nature scene, that if 10 different people describe it in different words or have different experiences based on it, their experiences are prototypal, but the actual nature scene itself, before the mind imposes a sense of rational thought and order on top of it and takes us out of the archetypal world, um, the ar ar archetypal is what's really there. So an archetypal plane would be, or a world would be an experience of things directly without any Medi preconceptions clouding one's vision of it. Or mediation. So Jung would say that this, uh, that an archetype always must be mediated. It always must enter into this middle sphere of, oh, well, we're in a different, well, it's here, oh. Well. Back to the other example, the middle sphere must always mediate an archetype or you're going to get that it uh, needs to be given expression. Expression and mediation, yeah. But direct direct absorption in archetype would mean... But, but it is what's <laughs> that, really... That would not be good. It's what's really there before you give expression to it. Yes, right. Typically in Jungian thought, he also talks about the idea of inflation. Inflation uh, is when one has self-identified with an archetype. And it's a little bit similar to pledge fever in in Peruker's writings. One could do some investigation there and write, find some interesting correlation, I think. So when a higher impulse comes, it's, uh, and it's not digested well, uh, this would 
can result in what Jung would call an archetypal inflation. You know, this can become patholo You know, something seemingly positive can become very pathological. And I think, uh, no, we won't give any examples. No. <laughs> anyway. Okay, I think it is uh, time to uh, close this part. Um, we go for. Uh,